Hey everyone, this is Coach Powell coming to you live once again, trying to share some opportunities with you um, about our nine step to relationship mastery program. Um, today I want to talk to you a little bit about, while it's snowing out here in, in live sun, Centerville, I want to talk to you a little bit about the nine step process. And the process is a very interesting opportunity for all of us to really understand how to develop professional relationships. Now, when you talk about professional relationships, it could be a harrowing idea and a concept because all of us have bosses or friends or associates or people we look up to. And these people could be excellent resources for us. They could be excellent people that will help us to move our relationships forward, move our careers forward, move our businesses forward. And no matter what you do, it is critically important that you learn to develop these relationships. Because when you learn these relationship skills, you're going to be a better, more well-rounded person. You're gonna finish your development, create more opportunities for yourself, create more opportunities for your life and the people around you. And the key about professional relationships is really understanding that they're not any different than personal relationships. But now, quite frankly, none of us went to personal relationship school. None of us went and learned how to develop personal relationships. So developing professional relationships is just as scary, just as tense as trying to go out on dating and learning how to get involved with more people in your life, learn how to get the right people in your life. This is no different, except for what's on the balance is your career or the process for your entire future. And these are very important relationships. So where do you go? How do you develop mentorships? How do you develop your board of advisors? How do you develop the support around you that you're gonna need to live your dreams and create the visions that you wanna create for your future? So that's what we talk about when we talk about the nine-step process. Now, for those of you who are paying attention live today, um, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna give you an opportunity at the end of our broadcast to really, really get some serious information and some serious discounts on the program that we're gonna offer in a few weeks called the Nine Steps to Relationship Mastery, the ladder to professional success. Um, now, there's a reason why I say there's a ladder to professional success, and I wanna show it to you right now. See right here? This is an illustration. In this illustration, there is a ladder. The ladder starts with understanding that there is a process of building professional relationships to the level that you want to build them. It starts with actually finding out how to get people to know you, to like you, and to trust you. Each one of the nine steps unveils the relationship and creates more power in the relationship for those kinds of things to happen. So if you have a copy of this illustration, I hope you do, you can download it on the Facebook page or anywhere um, on our LinkedIn page as well. You probably can find this illustration. But if you can't find it, don't worry. I'm gonna read it to you. I'm gonna go through it with you and on this broadcast today. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about each and every one of the steps. Now we can't go into detail on the steps because in the workshops and the seminars that we teach, we really have handouts that you can go through, you can write down. But I encourage you, if you have an opportunity, go ahead and take notes so that you can start to begin to develop and germinate your own ideas. And we're gonna try to do what we can to um, settle any questions that you may have. You can post comments in the comment box. I see my comment box on my screen, so obviously I can see the comments. And I'm gonna sit and, and have a cup of coffee. Um, so if anybody who's on the broadcast today has any questions that you wanna post, go ahead and post them in the comment box and I will get to those questions as we go through um, the workshop, fair enough? So let's talk about the first step in the relationship process. Learning how to listen is the most critical step. That's why I put it as step number one, and it is the most critical step. Learning how to listen is a skill that few of us really have. I mean, especially if you've ever gone to a networking function, if you've gone to a meeting and you've been with people and you see people are trying to help you um, do things and they're trying to help you get to places where you want to go in your life, but you don't know how to tap into who they are and tap into their personal greatness. It's all about listening. Listening is a skill that requires another skill. And the, the other skills are required are things like this. You have to be attentive to other people. You have to want to be attentive to other people, which means you have to be interested in the people that you're listening to. If you're not interested to the people you're listening to, 
and they're talking or they're trying to share some information with you, then the relationship is going to be stilted right from the beginning. You want to make sure that you're attentive, that you're listening, that you're engaged. The best way to be attentive and listening and engage is to ask really, really good questions. I always tell my uh, workshop attendees and, and my seminar attendees, you have to be able to give good question. Now, what do I mean by that? Giving questions and being able to say to people, you know, um, figuring out what makes them tick and figuring out what you need to know to truly understand them to the best of your ability is critically important. Now, I know a lot of times when you're sitting in a cocktail party or you're at a conference or you're you're just standing around uh, at the table getting ready to get some food at a major event that you're going to get to, sometimes the person next to you is a great person to strike up a conversation with. But what do you talk about? You might talk about things like why they're here, why they're here at the event in the first place, who brought them here to the event in the first place, how did they find out about the event in the first place, how long they've been attending the event. And these are questions that can get you into conversation mode, but a more meaningful conversation than uh, the regular stuff we get into, the small talk we get into, the weather, the football game, you know, the things that really have nothing to do with anything meaningful in terms of why we're here today, what we're trying to do today, how we might be able to help each other right now today. Very, very important questions to begin to ask. Now, a lot of my friends are uh, big on this question. What can I do to help you? That's a great question. However, there's a timing associated with that question. You cannot just go up to a perfect stranger, even in a networking function, and go, what can I do to help you? Because in reality, first of all, they don't know what you offer. Second of all, you don't know if you want to help them. You know, and you got to do some 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 background conversation. You have to have some communication, some very, very um, classically uh, good communications before you start getting into how can we help each other? What should we do next? If you try to <clears throat> go too fast in the beginning stages of any relationship, I will tell you that's a recipe for disaster. I remember giving a talk not too long ago um, to a group um, at 40 plus. Well, my friends are 40 plus out there. I want to say hi to you guys. I remember giving a talk to my, my friends at 40 plus, And one of the things one of the guys mentioned to me is that he had a problem finding mentors. And I listened to him talk a little bit and listened to him, you know, he, and he didn't disclose any of this. But as he was talking, I started to realize he likes to talk. He likes to talk a lot and he doesn't do a very good job of listening or inquiring or asking any questions. And I say, OK, I know exactly why you have a problem finding a mentor. And I bet I'm right about this. And I said, I'm going to ask you for, for permission. Would you mind if I share it with you? And he says, well, tell me. I said, well, you're not finding a mentor because you're not asking the right kinds of questions. You're asking people to be your mentors and they're telling you no. They're wholesale, and re wholesale rejecting you or they're giving you the runaround. OK, <clears throat> let's email about that or let's talk about that at some point in time in the future. That's not really a good way to develop a mentor. The, the, the first way you're going to develop a mentor is first by acknowledging that they have some skills and they have some talents that if you had would be a dramatic improvement in your life. Second of all, you want to ask them a single question that you know they can answer very well, very quickly and very easily. And in doing so, you're going to get them talking to you about something they want to talk about and about something that they can talk about and articulate very well because they know this inside, outside, and upside down. So you have to do your homework ahead of time. If you could figure out who's in the room, who you want to talk to, why you want to talk to that person in the first place ahead of time, that is doing your homework and that is taking you uh, in, a, in a great step towards getting where you want to go. A lot of times when you're going to go to conferences or parties, there's always a list of people who are there. There's always someone who's the host who can tell you who's a baller or who is a person who is really, really available to talk to you and share some information with you. And maybe they can even introduce you. At that point, you can use third party influence. You can use a lot of things to get ahead of the game. The next thing you want to do in the nine step process is you really want to do promises. You want to make promises. You want to keep promises. And promise is a very important strategy when it comes to building a relationship. Because after you've listened to a person, after you've really started to really figure out who they are, what they're all about, what they're trying to accomplish, where they're going, you now want to begin the process of making promises. You now want to begin the process of sharing with them something that you know that you have skilled it, that you can do for them. 
But however, like everything else, before you start to inquire as to whether or not a person wants to follow up with you, a person wants to meet with you, a person wants to talk to you further, you need to be get in the comf- and get comfortable with asking permission. Because if you're trying to make a promise to somebody and you want to share something with them, we're going to do something for them, and they are not giving you permission to do so, you're literally verbally and in the relationship point in sense, you are assaulting them right now at the same time. You're not doing a great service to yourself or to them. You're literally causing yourself a problem. You're really making it more difficult for you to move forward in that relationship. The other side of promise is being able to understand where they have promise, where this person that you're talking to has the ability to dig deep into their soul, into their psyche, into their processes and do something for you. The more you get good at listening to people, the better you get at understanding where they have promise or where you might be able to work together with them to create the next step in your relationship beyond the initial conversation. What's next? What's next? Do you send them an email? Do you call them? Do you uh, deliver to them some um, program that you know about or share with them some book that you read or some tape or lecture or any type of social media? These are all great things that you need to promise and then fulfill and deliver on that promise. When you meet a promise and you make a promise and you find promise and you create promise, people have hope. Hope is the greatest thing to building any relationship. What you want to do is infect people with hope. You want to make sure that people that you talk to, people that you work with, people that you hear from have hope in talking to you, in moving forward with you, in creating opportunities with you. But you can't do that if you don't understand and recognize their promise, your promise, and you you start to figure out where those promise uh, opportunities can come together and merge. The next thing you want to do is you definitely want to follow up and follow through. Relationship is done, and many relationships are done at a great conversation. If you're not having great conversation with people and then following up on that great conversation, you're dropping the ball everywhere you go. And I have people, I have friends and associates and people out there, they're great conversationalists. They're fun to talk to. They're great people to follow up with. They're just brilliant people. And there's so much fun to be around, to be with, to share with, and all kinds of good stuff happens around them. The problem is they don't follow up and they don't follow through. If you don't follow up, and you're out there lighting fires everywhere, creating all kinds of little um, opportunities for yourself and for others, but you don't follow up, that's not a very good look. That's creating more problems than you're solving. And this is a not a good thing for your brand, not a good thing for your business, not a good thing for your future. You want to be a person that is the kind of person that can be consistent, that can be relied upon, that can be trusted to follow up and follow through with what you say you're going to do. So if you're going to make a promise, I don't care what that promise is. If you're going to make a promise, you must follow up. Schedule the follow up. Meet the schedule. If you say you're going to talk to somebody, say, listen, I'm going to call you on Wednesday or Thursday at this time. Would this be a good time for you? If you're going to send them an email, I'm going to send you an email and then I'm going to follow up phone call with you. Or if you're going to do something to to facilitate a meeting, I'm going to send a meeting request for you. Then I'm going to follow up with you. You need to do it. If they are excited about hearing from you, and nine times out of time, if you, you tend, if you've done a good job of making promises, promises, <coughs> and then keeping those promises, they're going to be excited to hear from you. And you've set the stage for something magical to happen in your professional relationship. And I don't really care if you're looking for a person to be a coach for you, or a person to be advisor for you, a consultant for you, a therapist for you. It doesn't really matter. What really matters is, oh, I see my, my girl Tina's on the, on the line. Hey, Tina, how you doing? So good to see you. I'm glad you're here. Um, <clears throat> this is a wonderful thing. When you are following up, you have to do it well. You have to do it consistently. I like to have a plan for everything. Now, I'm a planner, which means is I'm not just going to plan who I'm going to get in conversation with. I'm going to plan what I'm going to say to them. I'm going to plan what I believe their responses might be, and I'm going to have several tiers for that. Then I'm going to plan on follow my follow-up strategy what I'm going to do next. Either I'm going to send them a free trial of something that I've already set up before, or I'm going to send them an opportunity to engage in something that I'm interested in or I find that they're interested in. Don't let me find somebody who's interested in racquetball because that's my thing. 
and I love playing. I love teaching. And so if, if, if they're even slightly interested in racquetball, guess what we're going to do? We're going to go play racquetball. We're going to go figure out how to get them in the court and how to get them engaged. If it's somebody I want on my advisory council, if I want to be a mentor for me, or if I want <clears throat> to somehow be in my inner circle, somehow I want these people to trust me and, and be a part of my life, and I want to be a part of theirs then I'm going to go the distance with them. I'm going to do the things I need to do to make sure I tremend I truly engage with them. This is key to making sure that our relationships work. Now, this is all in the first section of the nine steps. It is really how you get to know somebody. You listen to them, you make the promises that you have to make, and then you follow up. In the second tier of the nine step process, what you want to do is really, really lock in that relationship. You want to sink it in in a way that's going to be meaningful to you and to them. Here's how you do it. You have to do three things. You have to get connected. You have to meet with them consistently. And you have to establish a win-win process that you're always going to work to, you're going to work towards and work with. That's when a relationship is really going. That's when you know you really like each other. That's when you know you're progressing forward. Dominique is on the line. So good to see you, Dominique. Thanks for, for, for cheering and coming in. If you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the comment section and I'll do everything I can to answer those questions. So now we're talking about learning how to create more higher quality relationships beyond the conversation, the first initial conversation, the first initial communication or contacts. One, you want to get connected. So how do you get connected? All right. When you get in, when you're getting connected one, with people, obviously you want to find the commonality. You want to find where you guys have opportunities, where you guys have a uh, belief in each other, where you guys have, you know, some synergy between you two. <sighs> I love synergy. That's a great word because synergy means that you're trying to find a way to come together. You're trying to find a way to build something that you both can appreciate, but you can't do that if you don't have a really, really good connection. So after you've followed up and followed through, you want to sit down with one another or have a phone conversation with another, something that's a little bit more longer, a little bit more extensive, and you want to ask some even more deeper, more meaningful questions. It's one of the reasons why I created the True Voice process. Yeah, like you said, thank, thanks, Dominique. It's very important. You got to be genuine. And you can't be fake when you, want to, when you want to build a relationship because the last thing you want is people to look at you and go, oh, well, you know, you're just trying to do this because... I'm the vice president of this, or I'm the CEO of that, or I run this, or I run that. You know, you really have to be genuine. It's something of genuine interest to the people that you want to talk to. Because if you're not, you're going to come off as fake. It's going to show up as fake, and it's going to feel fake. And the last thing you want to do is try to fake it till you make it in relationships. That simply does not work. People will see right through it, and they will know that you're not really giving them all that you can give them, or you should give them, or you really don't appreciate them. And, and that's why I wrote the True Voice Questionnaire. The True Voice Questionnaire is 14 significant questions that you can ask a person. And literally, you ask these questions and you will know more about them in a very, very short period of time. And they will know more about you than anywhere else. What I really like about the True Voice Questions is when I really set that, when I set it out correctly, I will answer the True Voice Questions for myself and I write them down. And then I will send my answers to the people that I want to talk to, that I want to relate to. And, and I'll set up a time to ask them the same kinds of questions. What they then see is there's a process. There's a process that they know about, that they're familiar with, and they can understand what kind of questions are going to be asked. You don't want to just pounce on someone with the true voice process because it's like, um, they, they may feel like an interrogation. You don't want to have people feel like, I'm, uh, I'm so interested in you, but I'm going to ask you a thousand questions that are coming from left field and you don't even know what they are. You want to give people those questions ahead of time. When you're setting up that meeting, when you're trying to get to know them a little bit better, you just let them know, listen, I found these questions. These are the questions that I've, that, I've, that I've asked people over a period of time, over the years, that have been the greatest questions I could ever ask to really, really lock in a relationship and get to know them better. And they may seem like they're, they're personal questions, because they are, and they may seem like they're a bit invasive because they might be. But the reason why I'm asking the question is because we want to cut through all of the small talk and get right to the big talk in our lives to figure out how we can help each other. If you do that, then you're going to win with people more often. If you try to cheat the system, if you try to build what I call superficial relationships based on superficial information, then the relationship can't go deep. It can't really get to the next phase. Days, just having truly significant meetings, having meetings where you're sharing really, really important things 
not just about each other, but about your hopes and about your dreams. In fact, the first three questions in the True Voice system are all visionary questions. They're all made made to help people understand where they want to go in their lives, what they feel comfortable with in, in moving forward, who they want to be in the future. Where do they want to go in the next two, three, four, five years? How do they see themselves progressing? If everything, that I love this question, this is my favorite one. I'm going to share this with you right now. If everything was perfect in your life and you had all the money in the world and you had all the time in the world, what would you do differently? What would you do to be significant? What would you do to be more meaningful? Now, if you understand this question, this question is really about if you were omnipotent, if you could do anything you wanted to do, that means you had enough time to accomplish anything you want to accomplish and because you're never going to die and you had enough money to buy whatever you want or serve whatever you want or create whatever you want because that money is unlimited and accessible only to you. What would you do? How would you make the world a better place? What would you do? People give me some of the most amazing answers. Some people would, would basically uh, feed all the homeless people. Some people would give water away for free. Some people would, you know, make sure all the libraries are great. Some people would make sure education is available and easily accessible to all of the children in the world. Think of it. If you had all the power, if you were able to, and you had no amount of time, I want you, some of you who are online and now, post in your answer or your comment today, what would you do? What, what, what one single solitary thing would you do? If you had all the power in the world to make anything you want to have happen, happen, what would you do? I think it'll be interesting conversation. Um, this is all about really, truly getting together and having meetings that really are, are functional, that work, that move people's agenda forward. Um, as a sociologist, one of the things I study is why we as people need each other and how we use our social connections. And I know that many of us, especially in American and Western societies, are so individually processing things. We all believed that somehow, some way, if we would ever kind of take a break on things, we, we kind of have this mindset like we're all the lone cowboy. We all are out there trying to do it our way. And we're all trying to have it the way we want to have it, do everything the way we want to do it. And we're not really responsive to others. In fact, um, one of the things that America is really, really, really good at is that notion of the lone maverick who's out there all by themselves trying to make things happen. And that's simply not the way to make things happen when it comes to relationships, because relationships are a team. You're already in a synergistic situation. If you do it well and you work together, you're going to be stronger than you would ever be individually. So think about that. You want to have personal meetings that really, really work. You want to have meetings that drive people, that make people say, you know what? We can do amazing things if we share our resources, if we share our talents, if we share our opportunities. Which gets me to the next step in the nine-step process, establishing the win-win. If you're not working together to establish win-win relationships, you're working to establish win-lose relationships or no relationship at all. That is a problem. Every time you are with people or you're working with people and you're not thinking about how can we both win in this scenario, you're both losing. Now, the ideology I want you to think about is the collaborative opportunity. How can we accomplish more together than I can accomplish as an individual? And if you get good, at speaking the language of collaboration, talking about collaboration, sharing opportunities with each other, then you're going to find that people are more receptive to actually working with you, not for you, not against you, but with you. But you have to figure out and be willing to figure out and work to figure out the win-win. This takes an exhaustive amount of communication. You cannot, this is not a quick fix. No relationships are quick. You have to really spend the time it takes to make sure that you are creating win-win opportunities in relationships. And that might mean that you kind of work on making sure that you're, again, paying attention to the other person, you're listening to the other person, but you're also establishing, if I do this for you or we, or we, or we do this together, what is that going to mean for you? 
And that's a point I want to make. And it's a very, very significant point. Relationships that work well are how we know as individuals that we are bringing meaning into the world. Without relationships, without people, without feedback from those people, we have no clue as to whether or not we are doing things that are relevant, that are meaningful, that are helpful to others. This is key to creating win-win relationships. Because if you're not checking in with your partners or your friends or your associates who you're in a relationship with, and you're not asking them, hey, is this good for you? Are you working on this? Does this make sense for you? What about this works for you? I love that question. That's one of my favorite questions I ask when I'm into a professional relationship. What about this relationship works for you? Why are you in this? What's in it for you? Because left to my own device, I will never figure that out. But as long as I'm working with others, then we have a shot. We have an opportunity to talk and to get the feedback we need to make sure we're being relevant. First, I want to be relevant. I want to do things that are meaningful. I want to say things that are meaningful. I want to share ideas and concepts that are meaningful with people. I don't want to waste people's time. And I want people to waste my time. But if I don't seek to be meaningful, if I don't seek to do meaningful things, then I'm going to mess this up. I'm going to create opportunities or mess up opportunities that are, could be really, really good. And I don't want to do that. I want to make sure whatever I'm doing has meaning, has purpose, has power, has direction. And it creates the kind of synergy I want to create. This is how you establish the win-win. You cannot do it alone. You have to ask the deeper, more meaningful questions. Is this meaningful for you? Why is this meaningful for you? How does this work for you? Would you like it if it was this? Would, can we, what did, what, oh, look, here's another one. What can we do to make it even better? If you're not trying to get better in relationships, then the relationship is stagnant. And the last thing you want is to have a stagnant relationship because you only have the capacity to be in relationship with a few people. You don't have the capacity to have in your inner circle 30 or 40 people. I don't care how extroverted you are. And, you know, you need to have a small circle of friends because that's a circle that you can stay in touch with. You can communicate with. You can you can regularly, consistently follow up with and have an ongoing relationship. Relationships are always ongoing. If you don't have an ongoing relationship, you have a passive relationship. You have a what have you done for me lately relationship. You have an old relationship that you're trying to regurgitate, but it's not. if it's not working, if you're not meeting, if you're not talking, if you're not consistently working together, you're out of relationship. The best way to stay in relationship is to have consistent, regular meetings with each other where you're going to process information. How do we go deeper? How do we get better? How do we create more solutions with each other? You need to do that. You know, um, very, very important. The last part of the nine step process is probably the most significant part for people who are leading teams and creating large communities of trust with people. This is these three steps that are in this last phase are critically important. You have to do them. Number one, you have to create high performance teams and high performance is the key here. You don't want to create teams. You want to create high performance teams. Second, you want to plan to win. Whatever that, whatever win is for the group, for the association, for the small group you want to get together, for the joint venture partnership you want to do, you have to plan what winning looks like. Because if you don't plan what winning looks like, and I mean down to the daily steps that it takes to win, if you don't do that on a regular consistent basis, what I think you're going to have is a group who becomes stagnant, a group who becomes um, dormant, and they're not going to be able to get accomplish the things they want to accomplish. I don't think that I know that. And then the last thing you want to make sure you do is execute brilliantly. I can't say this enough. The way you do things is as important as the what you do. When it comes to leadership, when it comes to developing others, when it comes to being a part of other people's success, you have to walk it like you talk it. You have to be consistent. You have to have a level of discipline and focus. Your ultimate job as a leader is to do two things. One is to say, we're going this way. And second, to keep everybody motivated to keep going that way. 
as and you pull together as much resources as you can, pull together as much talent as you can, but stay focused on the goal and help everybody else stay focused on the goal. Here we go. Number one, creating high performance teams. This is critically important because it all starts with recruitment. If you're not recruiting the right people and you get the wrong people on the team, your team is going to be handicapped from the jump. You have to have the right people on the bus. You have to have the right people in front of you, with you, going with you, people that are talented, people that form a, that perform a critical role, and you want to avoid redundancies on the team. Now, I know this is like against everything we've, we've learned in our leadership manufacturing model of leadership. But when you have five people doing the same job on the same team, that's a recipe for disaster. Because everyone's going to try to be figuring out how they can they be better than another person. How can they one up the other person? And they, they won't collaborate well. They won't share with each other well. You need to have people who are specialists in every area that you need to have on the team. A team, a good team, may have six, no more than eight people on the team. If you have a 10-person team or a 20-person team and you don't have sub-leaders in certain categories and so on and so forth, I think what you're going to find is that the team doesn't function as well as it could if you had a type team. I like to think about a basketball team. And on a basketball team, everybody has their position. They're responsible for that position. They understand that position. Everybody else understands what the position is. And they know how to coordinate and work together. It has to be right. It has to be right. Because if not right, then it's not going to work as functional for everybody on board. And you need to make sure that when you're creating this high-performance team, you recruit for mm -hmm. talent. You don't recruit just for heart or mind or if they're funny or if they're fun to be around or they have great personality. You have to have a right combination of talent and attitude. And it's hard to interview sometimes for people with talent and attitude. You have to figure out exactly what skills that you need on your team, what talent you need on your team, and you need to ask in the interview questions, things like, how have you displayed this type of talent in the past? How have you been celebrated in the past? What have you done in the past that validates that you actually have this skill? Who can I call, who can I follow up with that will say on your behalf, yes, this is true. This person can do this, that, or the other. Because, again, that social third-party influence is a very, very important thing to have so that you have that backup that you have the skill. Second of all, if you are in the mode where you're trying to recruit people and then teach them, you need to make that clear. Because at that point, they're looking to you to help them develop a certain skill or certain talent. And maybe they don't want to, to develop that talent. Maybe they just want to be on the team, but they don't want to work in the position or in the, in the area that you really need them to have them work. And when you don't do that well, find a way to make sure that they're the right piece, person on the team, then you're going to make a ton of mistakes. And these mistakes can be very, very costly. You need to make sure that you're doing everything you can in the interview process, in the recruitment process. And by the way, when you're recruiting, you got to find people who are already doing it. Look at people who are already out there, who are already making it happen. Not people who are sitting on the sidelines waiting for an opportunity. Look for people who are already creating opportunities. And I always tell my friends this, you know, a lot of times when we want to do something, we think we're going to wait for somebody to give us the opportunity to do something. Uh, the reality is there's nothing that we can't do. We just have to do it, whatever that is. Just go do it and have make sure the right people see you doing it so that when you get looked at for a potential opportunity that you want, it's the opportunity that you want because you basically created the opportunity based on your skill, based on your talent, based on your desires and based on your attitude. If you don't start performing like you want to be, then... You know, people will accuse you of not having initiative, not having drive, not really setting out the right efforts in front of what you want to do. And that's not how you get on a winning team. 
So the best thing I would say people are like are people who are looking for jobs or looking for opportunities is identify the winning team you want to be on and then start performing in a way that they can see you. And especially the leaders, because that's how you create an opportunity that is far beyond what's posted in the job boards and all that kind of stuff. You don't want to wait around for the opportunity. You want to get to trust and how you get to trust is by performing exceptionally well. Think about every athletic team out there. What do they do? They identify the young players, the up and comers ahead of time, and they go get them. They don't have them come apply. They go find them, identify them, and they go get them. And it's very, very important. If you want to be on a winning team, you want to be chosen to be amongst the greats, then you have to figure out how do they perform? How do they act? What are the skills I need? And then be have them see you performing in those skills. No matter if that means an internship or if that means a volunteer opportunity to work with them just to test it, test it out. You could be interviewing them and saying, listen, I'm not sure if this is a company I want to work with or a group I want to work with right now. Let me volunteer to, to spend some time with you all. And in doing so, I'll work on a project. I'll show you what I do, how I do what I do. And if we have a good fit, maybe we can consider creating an opportunity. That's a great way to guarantee that you 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 know about the culture before you get involved with something. Well, I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a, a board or, or organization. It doesn't really matter. And you're going to have your third party influence and all of your friends and associates are going to say wonderful things about you. So those are things that you can bring to the table. It's a great opportunity for you to share who you really are, not just this, not just the skill or the talent they're recruiting for. Second stage in the building trust, especially in teams, is planning to win. You have to engage in flow. You have to make sure that you understand what the flow and the culture of that team is going to be and should be. And you have to make sure that everyone is engaged in that process. That means that's a lot of communication that goes on. As a leader, as a member, as, as an associate, as a producer, or whatever you want to call yourself on a winning team, you've got to communicate effectively and you've got to communicate where we're going. Everybody has to be on board with where we're going. If one person or anybody on the team is not on board with where we're going, you're going to argue about how to get there. Because you don't want to go in the first place. <laughs> and that's the last thing you want to have on the team is people who are on the team, but they don't want to go where the team wants to go. It's a recipe for a disaster. And if everybody isn't engaged in the flow in the right direction and they're trying to push against the flow or they're trying to create a, a, a damage to the flow, they're going to slow things down. They're going to create more problems and they're going to make everybody else's life miserable on the team. And that's not what you want. You want to make sure that the flow is consistent and that people who get into the flow know where they're going and they know how to how to participate. Um, let me see. Tina is just asking me a question. How do you do that uh, for a potential employer and not undermine no negotiating power, i.e. salary, blah, 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 blah. OK, so I think personally, and this is just my personal idea, when you are negotiating for salary, um, you have to. This adversarial relationship that we automatically think is 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 there in an organization. If we don't get rid of that right up front and just be up front, here's what I need. Here's what I'm worth. If you can't pay me that, if you can't if you, if you can't even conceive of paying me that, then we got to stop playing right now. If you can't be up front with that kind of stuff, then I think you're on the wrong team. You're looking for the wrong process. You're looking for the wrong people. You want to go where you're going to be valued most. And a part of how you're valued is you getting paid what you're worth. If you settle for less than what you're worth, you're going to be unhappy. And if they somehow negotiate you down to less than your worth, then you're not going to be happy. So you want to start that negotiation with what you're worth right off the bat and don't change it and don't go and don't do anything. Now, if they want a trial trial to see if you're going to be a good fit, if it's going to be worth their time, effort, and energy, then give them that. But don't waste your time trying to wonder what's in your back pocket, what's in my back pocket. Just up front, confess it, and be through with it because nothing will set you free more than the truth. And I think that's an important thing to know. When you're planning to win, when you're planning to engage, and you're trying to be with somebody, you got to give them everything. You can't give them a part of you because they're just going to hold something back because you're scared to share power or scared to share anything. Nobody can be scared to share if you want to create synergy, if you want to create a good relationship. You got to be willing to go all the way with it. Uh, and, and that means open up the Rolodex. By, by the way, if you follow all the nine steps, by this time, you can be open and honest with people. 
and you don't have anything to worry about because you know all the all, all the skeletons are out the closet, all the truth is on the table, and that's all there is to it. Um yet how do you ensure volunteering doing pro bono isn't going to be a belittling ask you you need to make sure if everything works out the way we expect it to work out within a few short weeks, would you consider bringing me on at this salary? That is it. They can't answer that question. If they're not even willing to consider that, then of course you don't do the work. That's all there is to it. Okay, we're going to move on to brilliant execution. <sighs> this is the most difficult part when it comes to manufacturing a large group of relationships and creating uh, a brilliant a win. And you're going to make sure that you want to do this. And how you do this is by making sure your whole entire team is engaging and moving forward collectively together. One step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time. I see teams all the time trying to run to the goal. And I, imagine a football field. Every time you score a little yardage, that is something that you have to do at, in the same way in life. If you have an end goal in mind, you just have to score a little yardage at a time. And the whole team moves down the field together a couple of yards at a time until you get a first down. You get a first down, you celebrate. You take time, you stop, you reevaluate, you huddle, you think about what you're going to do next, and then you get into the next play. And then you go that over and over and over and over again, consistently evaluating your strategy, consistently changing your direction, making sure that you're focused on the goal, but changing your steps in terms of how you're going to get there and being willing to make adjustments along the way, no matter what strategy you have or what plan you have or your team has in order to do things, you got to be flexible, you got to be adjustable, and you got to take the time to do that. Take the time to sit down in the situation room. Take the time to beat up the process. Ask yourself, is this still a winning process? Are we still doing things the right way? Are we still doing things in a way that's going to make us proud, win or lose? Are we moving forward? Are we growing? Are, are we creating more progress and more opportunity? Because if you're not, then you're losing. And you're, creating, you're not creating opportunities. You're not moving forward. You're not moving forward at all. So I think one of the biggest things I could tell people who are involved with teams is to make sure that while they're on the team, the team is taking a chance, taking a break, taking a breather, sitting back along the way and going, okay, how was our last five yards? How was our last 10 yards? How was our last goal achievement? How was our last, you know, uh, sub sub goal achievements? How did those things go? Was it was did, did it did it go well? What's the SOP? Do we need to change the standard operating procedure? Do we need to change where we're going to go forward in in the future? And if so, how do we make that change? Because if we don't do those things, if we don't take the time to reflect, time to breathe, time to you know share what what we've learned along the way, share those learning tips along the way. Um, then we don't learn as much as we can learn from each other and we don't grow as a team the way we should. And those, ladies and gentlemen, are the nine steps in a nutshell. Now, what I share with you is really a full day seminar <laughs> packed into small chunks. Obviously, you didn't get a chance to take a lot of notes. You didn't give a chance to do ask a lot of questions. So for those who post questions, I really appreciate that. But I really appreciate all of your time and all of your attention. It was fun. I'm planning on doing more and more and more of these live uh, type of opportunities where we go in deep on a on a concept and, and answer some questions that the audience may have. Hope you'll pay attention in the future. Again, my name is Coach Powell. I'm with Coach Powell Training and Development and the Roundtable. I look forward to hearing from you. Looking forward to seeing to you. You can always hashtag me or question, give me a question or a thought or idea at hashtag nine step guru. The number nine step guru. Yes, and I am the guru. Have a great day. Have a great life, and I hope to see you all again. Bye now.